Welcome back to PRV TV viewers. Behind me is the lovely, well, weed lake. It looks like a lake full of weeds, but there's a lot of birds out here, and I've got with me a brand new Fujifilm X-H2S, also their new 150 to 600. So I'm playing with both here today, just grabbing some bird shots to start the video. Now, I do want to mention that these are pre-production pieces of equipment. They're not final yet. Now, last night, we've updated both the 150 to 600 and the X-H2S firmware. Fujifilm got us some updates on that, so we should be good to go. Now, I do also want to mention that Jordan is also shooting on a Fuji film XH2S. He's using the brilliant MK18 to 55 sort of cinema zoom, but he is also testing out the 18 to 120 lens that is also coming out here on this launch. So, you know, it is actually going to be a lot of video talk today. I'm going to get through some of the photo features pretty quick because, you know, as interesting as they are, there's not that many changes, but the video side, well, that's extensive. So prepare to see a lot of Jordan today. I'm out here because I want to test some of the new features. I mean, this is now having subject detection autofocus, something a lot of other brands of cameras have, but it's brand new now to the X-H2S and one of those is birds. So let's get out and shoot. Now when we look at the name, we got a Fujifilm X-H2S and you know, talking with the execs, they're like, oh, you know, stands for maybe speed, stands for maybe sweet, for sexy, for, I don't know, just throw whatever superlative S word you want in there. Don't call it but you could call it the that would be cool. But maybe it also stands for stacked because that really is the big change here. We now have a First for Fujifilm, we got an APS-C 26 megapixel stacked sensor. Now, of course, this is a first impressions review. You know, take a look at the files, but we can't process the RAWs or anything. From what little testing we've done so far, the image quality looks very similar to what we got in the previous non-stacked 26 megapixel sensor, which is to say, excellent. I mean, we always liked that sensor. Now, this does open up, of course, a lot of possibilities because this is where the market's going. Almost, you know, electronic shutter exclusive kind of cameras minimal rolling shutter. Well, this sensor gives us 150 of a second as a max flash sync speed in electronic shutter mode. That's not bad, but if you consider that even like larger full frame sensor cameras that should be slower are pushing, you know, the Sony A1 and Z9 over that 250 of a second mark, this is not great, but it does still open up that fast shooting capability. This shoots 15 frames per second with its mechanical shutter mode, but in electronic shutter mode, 40 frames per second with autofocus. So clearly, Fuji is aiming this faster sensor at being able to shoot wildlife, sports, animals, birds. Now, if you take a look at the X-H2S body, it actually looks very much like a mini GFX100S, which is a good thing because we like that body design. I mean, this is definitely smaller and lighter. It feels fantastic, I have to admit. We've got the autofocus controls from the GFX100S, which is to say we've got that great joystick on the back, very customizable buttons. Now, this is interesting. This button down near the lens mount, this used to be a dedicated autofocus selector switch. Of course, if you're coming from an older Fujifilm camera, you're very familiar with this. Well, now they've just gone to a customizable button and it works because it brings up your autofocus mode by default. You can set it to anything else you want, but I, I do like that. I'm not finding that transition to be too hard. One thing you will notice though, the command dials, although excellent, there's not that push in button. I know it's driving Jordan crazy because he always customized that for punch and focus. Here on the top command dial, interesting that we now have seven customizable modes. This makes sense though, because as a hybrid camera, you're gonna want some for photography. You might want quite a few for videography. So you've got a lot there. And if you don't use them, well, it's just a lot of clicking for you, I guess, on the mode dial. Uses the exact same batteries as the GFX100S or X-T4. So you might even already have some of those lying around and you get an excellent 600 shot SEPA rated battery life. So, so far we've been shooting a lot with this camera throughout the day and we're still having plenty of power left over. So a couple things I'm noticing. First off, it is a hot day, so we're getting a lot of heat. Um, you know, not the sharpest pictures at distance, but uh, what I do like about it is just testing the new subject detection for birds. So it's actually picking them out from quite far distances. Very easy to be able to just use the joystick and move over to different subjects, even when I've got multiple birds in the frame. So I like that. Okay, so we move locations. We're now at Ralph Klein Park, one of our favorite little haunts here in the city, and we're just gonna find more birds. So get ready for Bird Shots Part 2. Oh, there's one. 
So overall, I do like the displays that we have on the X-H2S. 5.76 million dot EVF. I think that's a sweet spot for high-end cameras. I really like that res. And you can push up to 120 frame per second shooting for boost. I'm using that today for wildlife and it's working great. It does have this 240 frame per second option uh, where it says it'll actually dim the viewfinder a little bit. I don't need 240 frames per second. I'm not trying to get headshots in Call of Duty competitively. I think 120 is great. Now this I really do like. We have a fully articulating screen. You know how much Jordan I love those. We didn't have this on the X-H1 and I just think that's the best way to do it. So really nice there. We've got our top LCD panel. So it's nice to see it there, giving you that heads up display. Uh, one thing though I will say is that when you turn the thing off, uh, it kind of does this weird flicker and it doesn't seem to go away. And if they don't fix that, well, that's gonna be really distracting. Okay, so I want to talk about the buffer now on the Fujifilm X-H2S because they're really upping not only the actual shooting rate, but also promising a really large buffer. But I do want to preface this conversation by saying we actually did have a few bugs and some hard crashes here, especially with CF Express cards. And so it made it really kind of tricky. So first off, I think that this camera would have been better suited having dual CF Express card slots because it really is touting as being a fast sports wildlife shooting camera. But we do instead have a CF Express Type B and an SD card slot. Good thing though, because I was able to use my old SD cards and I wanted to test that as well. Okay, so let's talk about SD cards first. So we're shooting lossless compressed raw only for 40 frames per second locked off autofocus just to see how far we can go in the buffer. And with SD cards, I was actually really impressed because I was getting about 150 shots before it slowed down. I mean, not a bad sustained burst rate. And again, remember that's at 40 frames per second. If I drop down to something still very quick, like 15 frames per second, it would basically just go as long as I wanted it to, even with SD cards. Now, yes, after doing a big raw burst, it does take quite a while for that SD card to clear. You know, the processing light is blinking for quite a long time. Now, SD cards in this camera, we had no stability issues, but of course, as mentioned, we did have some lockups with CF Express Type Bs. We tried a few different brands, SanDisk. We finally settled on using uh, our Delkin Black card just because it's the fastest we've used so far. And I was actually very impressed by the buffer rate here again. I was getting anywhere from 190 to 220 shot bursts when I could power through and make it work. And that's pretty good. I mean, CF Express cards are gonna extend how long you can shoot for. And of course that card cleared out really fast. A few seconds, I'm ready to do another burst again. Okay, so we wanted to do our final test here. Now that we know the camera's buffer and we know it can shoot 40 frames per second, let's do a classic Jordan running test. Now, just to preface it, I'm using the 150 to 600 here at 150 millimeters, f5.6, and I have tweaked a custom autofocusing setting to give the camera the best chance possible, given that Jordan's not gonna be accelerating and decelerating rapidly, and uh, to really lock on tracking just on him. Face detect autofocus, and this is what we got. So, first off, shooting 40 frames per second with our focus priority to release. That was the only way that we could get to that 40 frame per second option. It did a pretty good job. You could see though that with Jordan, we are still getting a few shots where it's a little bit out of focus. And so, you know, not the most consistent performance. So then I decided, well, why don't we go to focus priority to see what happens? We definitely upped our hit rate, much better focus on Jordan. Most of those shots were in, but we only got a third of the frame. So we're not getting anywhere close to that 40 frame per second shooting. And so again, this is pre-production, but we're still in the scenario where if you wanna really maximize that frame rate, the autofocus is getting a few misses. So the main change here with autofocus is not only that it's overall improved, but more so that we now have subject detection. Beyond face and eye detect, you now have animals, you've got birds, you've got planes, trains, automobiles. I mean, it really is a full featured suite. Now. We were mostly shooting our kids and portraits as well as animals that we found around, mostly birds, but I did pay, take a picture of a cute dog as well. And this is what I'm gonna say. With the standard settings, I was getting very inconsistent autofocus. It would often go to the snout of dogs, but even portraits where Fujifilm face detect is normally pretty solid, get a lot of eyelashes or just front focus or back focus completely. Especially in continuous autofocus, I'm finding the camera will often just decide to reevaluate and go in and out. Now again, this is a pre-production camera, so I think that's gonna get more consistent. We've seen good consistency with the other Fujifilm cameras in the past. 
So as I mentioned, that first day, taking pictures of my daughter, taking pictures of the dog and stuff, um, you know, I was just using the standard autofocusing suite, not tweaking anything, and that's where I was having some inconsistencies. But today, because we've had a lot of opportunities to shoot birds here, I decided to then go in, make a custom autofocus mode, and tweak some stuff. Basically, you know, increase the tracking stickiness so it stays on one subject, and absolutely decrease its option to then look for other subjects. And by doing that, I'm actually getting pretty consistent results with continuous autofocus. Autofocus. I will say that after making that tweak, the bird detect seems to be working quite well. I mean, if it can see the bird's head or eyes, it does seem to consistently go there. So far, with the right settings, there's good potential there. Again, I gotta wait till we get a final camera to really make a full judgment call on how improved the X-H2S's autofocusing is. Okay, so we're gonna call it today with our outdoor field shoot here. And you know, George's gotta get home, he's gotta evaluate the footage. Of course, he's got opinions just using the camera. So let's now jump over to Jordan and he's gonna talk about what he thinks about this camera for video. Jordan here to talk about the video capabilities of the X-H2S and we got a lot to go through here. But first I wanna mention, Chris is filming me on the camera right now and we're using the 18 to 120 millimeter F4 power zoom lens built specifically for video shooters. Now, it's still a pre-production lens. I've got some concerns about the bokeh and sharpness of this lens, but I'll wait for a production copy before I really weigh in on that. So what's the major upgrade with the X-H2S? It's the stacked sensor that they've added, and that unlocks a lot of really impressive potential. For starters, we can get full width video readout on this sensor, up to 30 frames per second with very minimal rolling shutter, but also this unlocks 4K 60, or we can do 4K 120 with a, certainly a noticeable crop factor on that. But also, this is Fujifilm's first camera with open gate recording. That means it's using the entire 3x2 sensor. So this is going to be awesome if you want to reframe, or especially if you want to pull vertical video out of your horizontal video clips. But the other huge upgrade with this is they've put the F-Log2 profile into the camera, which is giving us noticeably better dynamic range than the older F-Log, especially in the highlights, you can really see it. But the thing I love is it maintains the ability to very easily grade this with Fujifilm's own 709 LUT or their absolutely lovely Eternal LUT. So you're getting lots of dynamic range, but still a very easy post-production workflow. Now, one really interesting thing with this is it actually has the most rolling shutter of any of the video modes. And we suspect that's because it's actually using 14-bit readout, where F-Log or any of the film simulation modes are using 12-bit readout. That's what's giving us the extra dynamic range, but there is a little bit more rolling shutter. That said, this is still under a hundredth of a second. It's quite minimal. Fujifilm has put a lot of emphasis on the different codecs. There's something for everyone on this. We've got H.264, H.265, 10-bit, but also they're giving you ProRes recording internally, and that's gonna be very easy to edit, although the file sizes are quite big. But I do like that this also gives you the option to use ProRes LT, ProRes 422, ProRes HQ. So if you do want a little smaller file sizes, you can use that ProRes LT. But what if you want raw, everybody wants raw video? Well, they've also got you covered there, but you do have to go external for that. You'll be able to record that external ProRes RAW to an Atomos Ninja 5 Plus or a Blackmagic Video Assist. Unfortunately, I have neither of those, so you should probably pop by. I'm sure Gerald Undone is gonna have a video and I know he'll test it with the Blackmagic Video Assist for you B-RAW shooters. Final Cut users, I'll get back to you. Basically right now, every codec you could possibly want is covered unless you like, like Motion JPEG or something. Big improvements to the ports as well. The headphone jack is back after the X-T4 where you'd have to use a USB-C dongle to get headphone line out. Here we've got that jack back, but that's not all. If you use a third-party Tascam recorder, you can now get four channels of audio going into this. We also moved to a full HDMI port, which is gonna be great if you're planning to use those external RAW options. It's much less fiddly than the previous micro HDMI connections. Unfortunately though, if you're using the fully articulating screen, you're still gonna find that bumping up against the headphone jack. It's a common issue with fully articulating screens. I just wish there was a hinge like what we saw in the Panasonic GH6. Oh look, that autofocus just moved smoothly from the foreground to me. Uh, let's talk about the video autofocus on this camera. My initial impression is that the interface is actually quite a bit stickier. It's not drifting off of your subject. 
However, we're gonna have to wait and see a full production value before I can properly make a judgment call. Also, I haven't used autofocus that much because Fujifilm shipped me a beautiful 18 to 55 MK cinema lens, one of my favorite lenses ever. I was using that a lot, but I ran into the biggest problem that I've got with this camera, which is the manual focus punch in on it is very, very soft and seems to have some kind of noise reduction going on it. Some objects will be somewhat sharp in the punch in, but some will be completely soft like eyes. It's just weird, it's very irritating. I wound up focusing with Chris's hair a lot as opposed to his eyes, which is definitely not a good way to work. I hope they fix this before the camera ships. Now all this video potential in such a small little body does mean there's gonna be some compromises and that's led to a small weird little fan accessory that is certainly getting a lot of attention. So let's go to my basement and run some overheat tests. All right, so welcome to my new basement video editing setup. Very proud of, oh, hang on one sec. Government of Canada, hello? Okay, I didn't know it was legally required for all YouTubers up here to put RGB lights behind them. I knew it was recommended, but apparently it's legally enforceable. But now that I am in full compliance, let's talk about overheating on the X-H2S. And I was very impressed. I mean, I had to run all of these tests at room temperature. It was still fairly cool outside. So 20 degrees Celsius, whatever that is in American. Starting with 4K 24P, I was able to record over two hours of footage, not seeing an overheat warning on the camera, and it wasn't even all that hot. And also I ran that test using ProRes 422, so it was writing a lot of information very fast to the CF Express card that gets hot, and still no problems. So next I tested 6.2K open gate recording at 24 frames per second. Again, ProRes 422, just enormous files on my 325 gigabyte memory card. I was only getting 26 minutes, so every 26 minutes I'd have to stop, delete the file, and start recording again. I was able to do that three times, again with no overheat warning. The camera grip was certainly getting quite warm, but uh, not uncomfortably so. For the most challenging test, I went to the mode that brings most mirrorless cameras to their knees, 4K 120p, recording continuously. And with the X-H2S, I was able to get an hour and six minutes before the camera overheated. And that was right as the battery light was flashing. So if you're on a single battery, basically you're getting a whole battery's worth of slow motion recording. And remember, that is well over five hours of actual real world playback out of that slow motion footage coming out of there. But hey, I managed to make the camera overheat. I guess it's time to grab the fan and see how we do there. What is this fan you speak of? Well, it's this kind of adorable little guy. For $200, you can grab a fan that you can actually screw onto the back of your camera. It'll use the camera's power to run it, and it will give you much longer record times, especially in very hot conditions, unlike the room temperature that I'm doing these tests in. And doing the 4K 120p test, I actually had to plug into the wall so that the battery wasn't the limiting factor. And there I got an hour and 55 minutes of 4K 120. That is nearly 10 hours of slow motion playback, so this does certainly extend the life. The thing is, the X-H2 Ace is actually really good at thermal management, so unless you're shooting extremely long sessions, probably plugged into power, or you're in an extremely hot climate, I don't think you're going to run into a lot of overheating issues, but it certainly is good if you're a professional, you have this option. But remember, this makes the camera very, very clunky. It mounts to where the flip screen would flip back. So once you've got this mounted, you can no longer close that. That means every time you want to take the camera in and out of a camera bag, you're probably unscrewing this little fan attachment. So I don't think it's something you would ever leave on the camera, but if you're like, okay, I'm setting up for a long concert rehearsal, I'll bolt the fan on the back, then it's not much of a problem. Other thing you might be wondering about is fan noise. And I have to say, when this was in its high setting, when we were doing that 4K 120 test, it is certainly noticeable. And I would say if you're using an onboard microphone, it'll pick that up. But if you're using remote labs or further away like you are for a lot of event shooting, it's not gonna be a real problem and you're gonna love having that uninterrupted record time. For a little while, I think there's been a real hole in the market for a very capable Super 35 video camera. I mean, we're seeing some really exciting stuff happening in the smaller formats like Micro Four Thirds, and then a lot of the cinema cameras are moving over to full frame recently, but we gotta remember Super 35 was the standard for decades, so a lot of the best video lenses in the world were made in this format, just like that MK18-55 to zoom that I love so much. 
So I do think this is one of the most capable cameras if you're looking at that APS-C format. I definitely want to shoot it out with the Panasonic GH6 once we get a production version of this camera. And that's my biggest question, you know, is the punch in manual focus going to be improved when we get a production camera? Is this camera going to be more stable? If it is, I think that Fujifilm has an absolute winner on their hands. But the trick is, you're going to have to subscribe if you want to see those final findings. So subscribe now and Chris is going to bring us home. All right, so clearly from our uh, initial look here, there's a lot that we still have to test and retest. I mean, you know, I would say that Jordan and I both agree for photo and video, at the core, this camera seems very solid. I mean, we like the body design. I have no complaints about the ergonomics. The EVF is nice. Uh, you know, it definitely shoots fast and the autofocusing has a lot of potential. But clearly there are a lot of bugs that we still have to get ironed out in this camera. So, you know, definitely excited to play with a final review copy. I hope that happens soon so we can really evaluate how this camera is behaving and especially things like the autofocus, the buffer, final video capabilities. But overall, it's a beautiful camera. It handles well. There's a lot of potential there. So I know this, uh, this first impressions take has left you with a lot of questions. Feel free to leave them in the comment section below. And as we get more information, we'll absolutely share that with you. But otherwise, check out deepreview.com. We will have a sample gallery of our initial photos from testing this camera, so you'll wanna see that. Otherwise, of course, as always, we really appreciate you guys joining us. Like the video, you know, leave those comments, subscribe to the channel, please do that. And uh, we'll see you guys shortly for another episode of Deep Review TV.